uh, with better robotic systems, tackling new problems, the sector seems to be on the cusp of a major transformation. And in the US alone, more than a third of hospitals have at least one surgical system in place that's robotic, and that's growing. And in fact, according to Intuitive Surgical, the number of US hospitals that with five plus robotic surgery systems in place grew more than five times in that period from 2015 to 2019. And so we're now seeing regular usage in areas of surgical procedures, including uh, neurology, uh, urology, gynecology. And on the business side, we're seeing that similar uptick, uptick. We're seeing increased number of patents. We're seeing more venture funding. We're seeing more M&A activity amidst the med tech giants. And so interestingly, when we look at all of this in, increase in, in robotics, we're still, still seeing global adoption to be low. Overall, we're seeing that number about 2% of surgical cases are being performed robotically. So we've got a long way to go. But the panel here today is here to provide that optimism or not. We'll find out well, very soon. So before we begin, uh, I just wanna highlight to everyone that you can get engaged, you can ask questions, go to the, the, the chat box on, on the bottom right corner, submit questions to myself or the panel. We'll try to incorporate that today as we can. And now I'd like to introduce uh, the panel today. So we have Mark Barish, uh, co-founder, Maury Medical. We have Lisa Carmel, Vice President of Strategy from Zymedica. We're pleased to have Eric Davidson, President, Flexible Robotics at Oris. Uh, Luke Harris, from, who is the CTO the, from CMR Surgical, and Phil Ratcliffe, CEO of Centerline Biomedical. And so uh, as, as we begin this panel, make sure that you uh, feel free to get engaged and, and chat. But I wanna launch a question to the panel. So robotics, we know it's not new as I just mentioned, and it's actually getting crowded now uh, with applications going into uh, similar areas. But the avenues that your companies are, ch are, are chasing are actually bringing a resurgence to the market. We're seeing that interest uptick. So how do you see the robotics ecosystem landscape evolving and uh, revolving? So, so for this, Eric, uh, why don't you take a stab at that? Sure, thanks, Keel. Um, so first of all, I think it's still early, right? You mentioned 2%, depending on the data you look at. Uh, and I would say perhaps we're in act two of a three act play, right? We're now seeing highly competitive spaces in robotics. Um, and it's only gonna get even more competitive, I think, as companies seek to become more specialized and seek to meet an unmet need, right? And I think that's the key for the entrepreneurs out there is that you have to be value-based in your approach and you have to be outcomes oriented or you get washed out in a competitive landscape. Um, but I'd say it's still early, not, not nascent like prior. Um, it's gonna be highly competitive and, and seek to differentiate. Mark, what do you think? Yeah, I, well, first, uh, thanks to uh, everybody for uh, the invite on the panel and to be with this fantastic. But uh, I think we see the ecosystem uh, evolve. We, we have the benefit system, which uh, now actually exists, and we can kind of build on uh, that. Um, I, I guess when I look at, at how this whole infrastructure and ecosystem is going to uh, put out, I kind of see Look, uh, medical robotics has, is really predicated on making the hard parts of procedures easy. Uh, and I think that's a, a lot of that's been validated. But uh, a couple of the things that have been raised, the potential of Achilles heels, you know, cost, and Eric said, really making sure that you validate your, your, your value proposition. But also, uh, as the ecosystem is, is being refined on this next generation, I think there's going to be uh, added emphasis on not just making uh, the, the hard parts easy, uh, but expanding the number of different hard parts we can, uh, we can address with robotics. And for us, that's things like getting it into the cath lab specifically for, for the structural heart regime. But then also uh, addressing things like making what had been the easy parts of open or laparoscopic procedures and, and making sure that robotics does not make those hard. Uh, and so uh, I think there's a lot of work uh, in the in the overall ecosystem. It's going to be, you know, for for setup and integration and uh, and the different uh, stakeholders, the uh, the scrubbing nurse and, uh, and and the patient workflow uh, training. Uh, I think a lot of the infrastructure that's going to build out is 
is not only going to be making the hard parts easier and easier, expanding what those hard parts address, but making uh, what what had been the easy parts as easy as they were in open surgery uh, or in laparoscopic surgery, but frankly even easier by integral electronic medical uh, records and all, all these aspects in, in and automating them and really improving the overall workflow. Got it. So, so Luke, you know, from your perspective at, at CMR Surgical, tell us a little bit about about your company and how you how you see this uh, evolving with, uh, uh, with with this latest thing in, with uh, robotics. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, uh, CMR Surgical was started in uh, you know January 2014, uh, based around the premise of well, exactly as as Mark and Eric have described. That robotics should make the hard parts easy, um, but also critically, it shouldn't make the easy parts any harder. So, um, the premise of the surgical of, of, of the Versius system was to create a system that could be very widely used. It's modular. It's human scale. You can see a bit of it behind me. Uh, uh, it's modular. It's human scale. It fits into uh, existing ORs. Um, uh, it brings the benefits of a superior tool, and and, and in many ways, CMR. Although we clearly make robots, it, it, it's the application that's important. It's the application that drives us, um, and I think that's actually the fundamental thing to remember about the market. Uh, it, it, it's easy to say that you know even currently the robotic market is enormous uh, and valuable, but actually, as you quite correctly said, the actual true market is vastly larger than uh, uh, is currently being. Uh, um, uh, being sold into by existing systems. And so um, we certainly are competitors, but I think it's also important to recognize that actually there's a sense in which what we're competing against isn't, in many ways, isn't each other. It's the conventional way of doing surgery. Uh, uh, and we believe that together we found a better way, a superior tool. And now we're all working out very, very hard to find our way of bringing that particular vision to our, the part of the market that we, that we think will benefit most from it. Yeah, actually, Luke, you bring up a good point, which is, you know, although you, in, in some ways you're, you're competing, uh, in a lot of ways, you're, you're actually working together to, to improve the whole area of adoption and fix the, the global challenges around robotics. So let's, let's take a different approach. So I, what I'd like to do maybe at this point is, you know, all of your companies, you know, Luke, to your point, improve the value of robotics and healthcare. And maybe we could take a, a few minutes here to have each of you talk about how your you and your companies actually are are improving that value of robotics and and adding you know more of a uh, augmented value to the system rather than competition. So we'll start out actually uh, with, with Phil, if you want to tackle that, and then we'll move on to the others. Yeah, sure. Th thanks, Akil. Uh, and thanks, Lisa, for putting on this uh, this event. Um, what we do at Centerline Biomedical is uh, in provide three-dimensional, rich surgical navigation for endovascular repairs. Uh, we've got a commercial product right now that we're beginning to commercialize in the U.S. And where we see the intersection of robotics plus navigation is this kind of paradigm shift that, yes, you can get more minimally invasive with surgeries, but if you can't see where you're going um, and with rich 3D and you're still relying on, you know, radiation admitting fluoroscopy, um, that can be challenging both to the provider, the healer, the people in the rooms. So as I think about kind of how the intersection of some of these companies will play, um, you can be more minimally invasive, but you really need that map of where you're going to go uh, with more uh, rich colors in a three-dimensional state. Great. Mark? Uh, yeah, so um, when we think about the value that, that uh, Mori Medical actually brings to this overall robotic ecosystem, uh, again, our, our primary um, uh, movement to, or expansion of robotic technology is is into what's actually uh, already a minimally invasive environment. We're uh, we're actually treating uh, patients in the cath lab, and and that is inherently a minimally invasive uh, setting. Uh, what what we've really uh, tailored our technology to do is uh, is really to take uh, therapies which 
uh, work very well when they're delivered by uh, the centers of excellence, doctors with hundreds of procedures under their belt, uh, and, and broaden with technology, kind of raise the bar of not just the centers of excellence, but actually the general uh, population that's actually delivering things like mitral valve repair, uh, so that uh, through the use of technology, we can actually improve the outcomes of patients uh, in the bulk of the market and not just at the hands of the specialists. And this is, uh, this is a, a, an area that uh, we've, We've got great data in our uh, in, in our regime to show that uh, that this is an area where there's uh, technology can really help improve that overall uh, patient outcome. Yeah, Lisa, I'd be great to hear your perspective from Zymedica on this. Oh, hello. Yeah. But, um, so uh, Zymedica is uh, a full service uh, med tech product development firm, and a core competency of ours is in you know, surgical robotics. And uh, we we think that um, we are seeing quite a bit of work that we're, we're, work, we're working on in future-proofing uh, technologies. And a lot of future-proofing uh, and helping companies is to stay competitive and to drive high, better value and, and lower costs. So we, we see um, a lot of the work that we envision we'll be working with is in um, design for manufacturing, um, delivering um, cost-effective uh, solutions, um, uh, putting the robots um, uh, in places where they might not be right now, um, like in the outpatient setting. And with COVID, we saw where we are seeing a fast forward being played where robots need to be moving um, in places uh, where um, where they're they're nimble, they're smaller. They might be handheld. They might look a lot like uh, Mark's um, uh, Moray Medical um, uh, robot. And um, let's see, what's another area I'd say? Um, oh, and also taking a look uh, ahead when in terms of driving value. We see a lot with what goes uh, attached to the, the robot, the, the add-on kits, the, the right tools and future-proofing to, to look ahead to make sure that the right tools are in the tool belt uh, for that robot to drive increased value. Great. Eric. Yeah. How about you? Yeah, so, you know, at, at Oris, we are looking to elevate and transform endoscopy much like intuitive surgical did in transforming and elevating laparoscopy, you know, nearly 25 years ago, we're, we're looking to do the same and, and think in endoscopy, there's great benefits to be had for patients and physicians. Chief amongst those is earlier and more accurate diagnosis of lung cancer. And with our modern platform today, we're indicated in lung cancer for bronchoscopy. Uh, and our goals are to elevate the diagnostic yield um, eliminate false negatives, uh, improve the patient journey, and save lives. Um, in addition, we built a broad-based endoscopic robot. It, it's, we truly thought about the term platform, which is often overused in, in the high-tech field, but, but we've sought to do so, and it drives endoscopes. The robot doesn't care what type, and we're in bronchoscopy today, but, but have um, plans and designs to move into other endoscopic disciplines with uh, similar uh, intended benefits for patients, and uh, and we believe we're well on our way to doing so. Great, and Luke, and I know you touched upon this a little bit earlier, but uh, how do you see CMR adding to that that value in robotic surgery? And and in your case, it's it's uh, it's global because you're you're in Asia as well, which uh, which is definitely novel. Absolutely. Uh, um, so yes, I I mean CMR was set up from the very beginning to be a a global medical devices company based in Britain. Um, the attitude I think we have is one of providing a surgeon with better tools. Um, uh, the vision for CMR was always that you know, laparoscopy um, offers huge patient benefits over open surgery, yet 30, 40, depending how many years you count into the story of laparoscopy, it's still not universally available. And the reason is that manual laparoscopic surgery requires an extraordinary amount of skill and expertise, especially for the most complicated procedures. Um, people have been trying to reply robotics to it for 30, 40 years with, in many ways, a great deal of success. 
also, however, practically, as we all say, um, the penetration of robotic technology has not been um, uh, anything like universal. Uh, uh, CMR set out with a view to create a robotic system, a better tool for surgeons, um, which had the potential to be universal. Um, uh, and really, every decision we've made about the system is informed by that. You know, it, it's modular, it's human scale, uh, it fits into existing ORs. Uh, you can set it up how you want to because it's in different bits that you can put around the patient. And when they are all around the patient, you can still get to the patient. Um, so uh, uh, really, I think it, it's the benefit of coming a little bit later. It's the benefit of you know, general technology having moved on, moved on a bit. Um, but it's also the, the benefit of being able to now really understand what the potential, what the what the potential is, and and and, and to set out to try to achieve it. Um, and we benefit. We certainly do benefit from being from being global. I mean, it has its challenges. There's a there's a particularly when there's a pandemic going. There's a certain advantage to sort of being in. Oh, one market and hopefully that market being in the same stage as things as you are uh, uh, where we're support we've, we've had to support continue to support places around the world uh, uh, as they come out of lockdown as they go into lockdown as they start surgery as they stop surgery it's been very challenging um, I think in many ways it's been a little less challenging for us than it might be for some companies because you know change at CMR has been pretty much constant and uh, 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 this was another example of it um, uh, I feel sorry. I feel I'm wandering from the question a little bit. Um, uh, but in terms of what we of what we're bringing, I mean, I think what we're bringing is the use of robotics, incidentally, to provide a tool that can actually finally become truly universal. You know, our, our, our company mission has always been to bring the benefits of minimal access surgery, not robotic surgery, minimal access surgery to everyone. We happen to use robotics to enable it, but I think it's. It's always a bit risky when robotics becomes an, an end in itself. It needs to be it needs to be the enabling thing for for something which is you know, has, has very real benefits. For us, that real benefit is the ability to create a tool that can fit into ORs that surgeons can use using their existing procedural knowledge, but with a new superior tool. That, um, that's a good point. That's a good point, Luke. So. You know, I, let me ask you this. I, I guess to the panel, we, uh, it, it, you know, probably one of my favorite areas is this whole area around um, uh, automation. So let's let's think about it this way: where, you know, humans in general, when we use robots, we're using them as users and collaborators uh, to complete a, a, a task. And then as these tasks become more serial, um, and in the case of say anatomy, as it becomes more defined, we can actually do things like mapping and then get to that future uh, autonomous state, very much like, like self-driving cars that we see now. It started out very basically with just mapping. And so um, how do we see uh, this, this evolution towards that eventual state of uh, autonomous robotics? So Phil, you're building a navigation system. So uh, tell us how, how you think about this. Yeah, so that's a it's a great question. When I when I reflect on the analogy of uh, a self driving car, um, you you know you can have the best car in the world um, and great tires and windshields and all the good uh, extras on it, but if you don't have uh, your coordinates and understand where you're going from a navigation system, the car doesn't know where to drive to. So what we're trying to do, you know, really at Centerline is you know, bridge that. You know, we're not a robotics company, but we have a technology around navigation in order to better help the healthcare provider and the physician get to where they want to get to quickly without radiation uh, and in a, re a reduced radiation state. Um, so when I think about that analogy, um, I do think, uh, you know, the combination of these two could get to what you just described with this series of tasks really being the ultimate nirvana um, in the healthcare society. Mark, how, how do you approach this? Because I, I, with, with Moray Medical, this is probably a, a key piece of how you want to uh, uh, get to eventually. Yeah, it's, it's a, a really interesting question for us. And <clears throat> I think I think a self-driving car is a pretty good analogy. Uh, I have to admit, uh, in some ways, I think of uh, Really, the audience took place in uh, in the pilot, uh, and, and so uh, 
I think some of that uh, is is also a good analogy. But I think uh, I think what a lot of it comes down to is individual tasks. Um, uh, I think what Phil was saying is is uh, really interesting. Um, you know, the there's kind of the navigation task, figuring out where you're at, where you want to go, and kind of automating that plan. Uh, and there's the, the task of anyway, outline where you want to go. Uh, uh, and actually, uh, you can you can do that and drive it uh, interactively, uh, which you uh, you would do with your car and the GPS so you're playing up. Uh, but then you you may actually uh, benefit from individual tasks uh, that uh, that uh, uh, the that architecture with. And an example is an auto throttle. If you're flying, you're coming in. You're you've got your approach. You figure out where you're going to land. Uh, and you say, okay, just keep me at this speed, and I'm going to I'm going to come in. What what it might be is uh, you're you're offloading some component of what you're doing, even though you're in full control. Uh, and I think there there are going to be a number of things that are that are like that. We our our architecture is set up to uh, as as Phil said, we got to know where we're at, and we're going we define where we're going to go to. Uh, and then I I think as we go farther down the road, we're not just going to then. We, we now can can actually automate the move or do it interactively. Uh, but then we're going to go uh, to a series of tasks where we say, okay, you've got there uh, now for for one particular task, and that's deployment of a prosthesis. You may want tactile feedback where you hold the robot still and then you just uh, pass things through the robot and, and do it manually. Other things you may want to say, put up uh, an anchor in place or uh, or something as they've done in orthopedics and other other things, offload that part of the task and have that automated and, and do that component uh, in a very automated manner. So I think it's going to, as with the, whether it's the car analogy or the pilot analogy, uh, I, I think as we gradually offload some of the repetitive tasks, it's just going to make the, the 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 surgical procedure more and more repeatable and. and uh, and, and again, make it uh, more consistently high quality uh, for for the bulk of the physicians that are providing the therapy. Great. And Eric, how do you see this? Do you see a, mon a Monarch 5.0 eventually being fully autonomous, or uh, how would you approach it from the Oris um, point of view? I don't see that. And maybe this part we can mix it up a little bit. I, you know, look, it's about where you place your innovation bets, and I, I think they're better uses of funds broadly uh, to use data and, and, and analytics, and then we may get into this later, to enhance physicians' decision-making, make their skill set uh, elevated. Uh, certainly, yes, I, I agree that the comment on tasks, there's certain elements of a procedure that can be automated and perhaps will and should be at a future date. But at the highest level, I think automation is not where the greatest gains will come from our investments in the coming five years. Um, and, and our design is to keep the physician in the in the loop um, forever, and, but enhance and and elevate their experience through data and, and, and other means, uh, you know, precision, accuracy, visualization as well. So I'm not as bullish on the automation. Uh, there's a role for it, but but it's not the bet uh, that we're putting most of our chips on as of now. Great. So there's a question from the audience: uh, What changes to the OR environment? do the panelists think would most benefit the use of robotic systems? Luke, what do you think of that? So how, how would I change the OR environment? Yes. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, my glib answer is flat floors. Uh, um, but uh, uh, more seriously, um, I think you're going to see uh, um, ever more this sophisticated needs for communication and data comms. And if I think of some of the challenges that we have now um, when we're in sort of versus, you, you can solve the physical challenges. You can get, you know, we fit through doors fine. Um, uh, we fit around a patient fine. Uh, but actually, one of the tremendously important things, and uh, uh, I hope we can get back to the car and the, and, and the autonomous discussion, is the thing that enables the future development of um, surgical procedures, of increasing levels of automation, and we can argue about that, and, and all sorts of good stuff, is the ability to get 
valuable information out of the OR that you can then uh, process, think about, gain knowledge, gain wisdom, feed back into the OR as a result. Uh, and we're right at the very, very early stages of that. Um, but all too often, the infrastructure around getting uh, that data in and out uh, is, 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 is difficult. Uh, and, so, and so actually, if, it, if you said you can change you know, one thing, what would you like? What I would really like would be a, a guaranteed high bandwidth link into, into the OR. <laughs> yeah. Lisa, you probably have a perspective from what you see and what you're exposed to. Do, do, you, have, do you have any insight on, on, uh, on perspective around that changes to the OR environment? Well, I sort of, uh, one thing that it just sort of came to mind, but it's what I sort of alluded to earlier is getting uh, the, in terms of getting the right patients to the right part of the hospital. And I think they're the goal, some of the, what we're seeing is um, an interest in seeing patients move to um, minute, more minimally invasive procedures and getting them to the outpatient setting and, and moving and, and getting and stratifying those patients. So that is um, um, a trend that we're dealing with and taking a look with uh, look at, especially as we're projecting out uh, in a COVID world. The, the, the only thing I'd add, Akil, is the, uh, you know, I was in a case last week, there was 15 people in the hybrid room and space is tight. Um, so the use of, you know, some of the things we're working on with uh, augmented reality and being able to not have everybody, you know, looking around a shoulder, trying to look at, a, at one screen and actually have that same screen in front of everyone with a heads up display um, is one of the avenues we're going down. But I think, you know, enabling those technologies uh, to get out uh, into these OR suites would really help streamline so much in the, in the OR room. I mean, obviously every person that's in there is another person that could do something wrong, could break sterility, uh, whatever it could be. So I think uh, trying to streamline that and, and actually minimizing the amount of people in a room is a, is a goal of ours. You know, it's, it, it's a good point. And from, from my perspective, in the, in the few cases that I've seen, uh, the space is an issue, avoiding bumping into equipment, you know, the, having, you know, the, your, your head bump against the robot, all those things would, uh, you know, for th those that are directly near the field, it becomes an issue. So, you know, Mark, you touched upon something earlier in the conversation around what, what I almost wonder is a is a uh, almost like a chicken and an egg issue, which is are we are we designing the ecosystem and infrastructure for robotics, or is it the opposite? Which is are we are we really designing the robot for the ecosystem? You know, things around training, uh, space preparation, proctoring. Um, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think it's, it's a little bit of the benefit of, uh, of of all that's gone on before is we we now get to look at, uh, um, yes, some wonderfully successful and, and one in particular uh, robotic structure that went in and then had to fill out an ecosystem of training tools and uh, and support staff and, and uh, technical and, uh, and and all the data uh, uh, communication links to be able to allow that thing to function, and we can kind of look at this ecosystem that was, as you say, you know, that the robot started and the ecosystem had to be built around that thing, and now we can kind of take a look at that and say, uh, hey, you know, we're we're starting with a new architecture, uh, and uh, and we see that boy, the you know the uh, the simulator and training uh, aspect of this is just hugely important. Uh, and uh, we, we'd say, hey, let's let's think about actually building the robot so that the very accessible hardware things that people have uh, houses, you know, their their computer, uh, the phone, uh, other things that they're they're going to always have access to, that those can be training tools that they can use uh, so that when they get in the environment, they're faced with this robot. They've already interacted with something that, that uh, seems very familiar. Uh, so uh, now I think we're kind of transitioning. The, the ideal world, the, the chicken and the egg should influence each other, right? Um, and you shouldn't design one without the other in mind. They had to start with one, uh, but now we've got the benefit. Uh, yeah, we're, we're uh, fully uh, designing our 
uh, our architecture around the kind of data portals that have been established and the bandwidth of things that are available. Uh, and, and it's really important uh, that we don't have to uh, create uh, uh, ecosystem which is not going to fit in with the, the other ecosystem that's already been built, but that our robot reflects it. Yeah. Eric, how do you look at that? Yeah, I mean, I, look, you have to build your product for the ecosystem as it exists today. And you think about operating rooms, if you stood in one in New York City or in Bangladesh, wherever, that it's going to take decades to change the bricks and mortars, if, if ever. And so you design your product uh, for the environment it's in. Uh, and, and to that end, yes, smaller footprint, more flexible, easier to use. But then that's not to say you don't have influence in the environment, right? Surgical support staffs have become incredibly adept at taking on new technology of the last 20 years. And so training is paramount and not just for th the physician, but also the staff. And, and with that, you have control and, and, and you should be diligent in your, in your approach there and invest in it because it's incredibly important. Yeah, I, I, I just want to chime in. I don't think it's going to be hard to change the ecosystem and what's already ingrained in all these hospitals. So your ability to design a product that can seamlessly fit into the workflow as it's done today is critical for product adoption, or it'll never happen, or you'll be having the same conversation in 20 years. So having one that it's on wheels, that's a low footprint, like you said, Eric, that can go in and out of the room, that doesn't require a, a tech or even a company representative to be there in there to run it, um, is a big benefit um, of technologies in the future for adoption. Yeah, I agree. And I'll add something yeah. to Luke. Agreed. Just briefly, sorry, is, is, you know, data, right? Connectivity is, as I think the biggest gains will be in, in IT, enhancements in operating rooms around the world and, and how you tap in and leverage that is going to be really important. And, and that can change rapidly versus, say, the, the bricks and mortar constraints of, of the environment. So, Luke, I jumped in on you. Uh, no, no, I, well, I, well I, I, was, I, was, I was going to rather boringly, vehemently agree. Uh, um, uh, it, you know, it, is, it is necessary to design a product to work with what's out there now if you want us that product to be out having an influence now. And unless you get that influence, you're not going to be influencing the way things are moving forward. Um, I think you make a very good point on the ability for IT to change more rapidly, which is, you know, is a very important architectural point. You don't want to find you know, yourself locked out of those changes because of architectural choices you've made as a product designer. That's been very important to us. Um, but... Uh, yeah, as you say, ORs will not change rapidly over 10 years and saying everything's got to have a steel gantry that you can hang, you know, a ton's worth of equipment off or something like that is, 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 is not a path to success. Um, my greatest desire for, for Versius actually was that it was just going to become part of the furniture. <laughs> so we have, a, we have a question from an audience member, uh, cybersecurity. So, so this is obviously... Uh, a hot topic for healthcare systems, and, uh, not to mention uh, everything else that's going around us. But it's it's highly relevant right now in the unprecedented healthcare attacks. So how does the ecosystem ensure the safety for robotics in the OR space? And what, what do you see your role is in ensuring that the systems you're designing don't open up more vulnerabilities? Who wants to tackle that? Um, I can, I, yeah, so, so, um, yes, I mean, I think, I, th I think the easy side of it is, um, preventing what you might call clinical problems. Uh, uh, you know, it's not difficult to physically firewall the, uh, uh, the medical device side of a device from the, from the, from the, from the information services side of a device, uh, at, at least at some levels, it, it, it's harder if you need to go backwards and forwards. The bigger side of, uh, 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 you know, cybersecurity is, of course, if you know, and, and we feel this very, very strongly as a company, if we are gathering large amounts of information about uh, uh, surgical procedures, um, even if it's anonymized, that's a very great responsibility as to how you look after it. Uh, uh, what are you doing with it? We take the, you know, that transparency very seriously. And actually, again, that we've architected that into actually both ourselves as a company and the technology from the very beginning. Um, it, the potential gains of this are enormous. And actually, one of the things that terrifies me is some player in this field not acting in a responsible fashion, 
uh, and the resultant backlash leading to uh, an, an enormous amount of um, the slowing down of the uptake of what is potentially a comp in, an entirely transformative sort of technology. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just say, Akia, yeah, we, we, we value and obviously um, put a lot of stress in our company as far as cybersecurity is concerned and can making sure you have redundancy. Redundancy in the fact that if you uh, do use a cloud-based uh, service for HIPAA-related uh, um, information, um, you need to have a backup. And whether that's, uh, for us, it's as simple as a thumb drive uh, to allow you to uh, stay off a system uh, or packs uh, or packs or a uh, EMR, um, and it will still be able to run uh, your system. I think you need to have it. You need to have it both ways because you don't know when things are going to happen, and you're going to need to treat it as um, you know, something so crucial. Um, you know, it, it can kill any company quickly if you have a breach. Yep. So let's let's uh, let's go into maybe a, a parallel area. So we, if we think about data, right? So we've heard. You know, we've seen things around uh, uh, integration of data. We've talked about accumulation of data, data migration. I mean, data is a key piece of everything that we're doing. So what does it mean for, for you and your company? And how are you using data? How do you think about data? How critical is data to the future of what you're doing? Um, Phil, I, I, I know that, uh, you know, in, in the things that you're doing, it's obviously important. But how do you view data? Yeah, so so right now, um, as we begin to do more clinical cases uh, in our controlled launch, um, you know, our ability to kind of take that data, mine it, understand exactly uh, what things were done in a procedure that made it more efficient or not um, is really important. So I think, you know, it is a, a component of our strategy. It's not in the, the near term one to two next years. Um, but as we gather more and more cases, we're going to be able to do a lot of things with it. Um, I know it's somewhat of a, uh, a vanilla answer, but um, you know it, it's important. But it's not not our focus right now. Got it, Eric. How do you approach data for orgs? Yeah, data and data strategy is incredibly uh, important. As I alluded to earlier in the Thomas conversation, the insights you can draw from data in, in multiple settings: preoperative, interoperative, postoperative. Is is are, are many and, and and significant. I think the key is early. Is you have to invest, right? You have to have the infrastructure to, you know, house the data and then draw insights from it. And so it's not something you can easily catch up on. And so you know, for us and others, uh, you know, we we believe uh, investing early in the architecture, uh, having a sound plan to to warehouse data and then pull insights is, is invaluable. And if you can give the hospital operational insights. The clinician technical insights and ultimately the patient and and, and, and providers outcomes driven insights from data that that that's enormous and it's, it's a great gain for not only our company but for you know healthcare technology companies and general so we're uh, we're investing there great mark yeah i i was just going to say i think i think building your your data architecture is in so many ways as important as your robotic architecture. I mean, robotics has, uh, robotics architecture has the, the capability of uh, consuming and generating just absent piece of data. I mean, we uh, we use off-the-shelf imaging, and so, uh, you know, we, we want access uh, to, to data. Uh, but we're generating sensor streams and you know state streams and uh, all kinds of, uh, of data streams. So uh, you know uh, analytics data so that we can uh, we can take that data in a useful way. Uh, we want sensor data, uh, get different forms of imaging aligned and get those things. Uh, we want to augment the data. Uh, you know, uh, down the road with uh, artificial intelligence, but even now with, uh, you know, combining what's what's really robotic data with with image data, uh, and then we kind of see um, a lot of benefits in in uh, data summarization. Like, yes, you can take all this huge amount of stuff, and you can either warehouse it all, and, and you're going to have to 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 store a lot of it, but. Uh, if you can take advantage of the other developments that are going out in the in the tech world, edge computing, figuring out where to uh, compress it into the meaningful components, 
send those pieces back and forth, especially when you're going to say be working with a remote uh, doctor. Uh, who, who wants to be able to see what's going on, but doesn't necessarily need this huge data pipe uh, flooding in with huge amounts of information. Uh, I think if you get that architecture kind of right early on, uh, we've found uh, that, uh, boy, it makes, it makes things uh, easier. And we've actually, for a very, you know, we're a young preclinical company, and yet we're already iterating on our data architecture to be able to handle, manipulate, ship, and store the right kind of data and, and, and do it efficiently. Yeah. So there's a question from the audience, um, and, and Lisa, I'm going to maybe throw it out to you, but it's, uh, so are there particular surgical procedures you think are ripe for robotic use? So. And the reason I throw it out to you, Lisa, is you've got this perspective, right, where you're, you've seen a lot of things across the gamut. How do you look at that? Uh, maybe not maybe not so much on surgical procedures, but areas that are white spaces, areas uh, even in, uh, in uh, medical fields that you see there's opportunity. How, how do you think of that? You know, it's it's interesting. Um, I was uh, uh, we were just talking about this uh, internally and um, placing bets and what you know. Some of the areas that we're looking at are are procedures right now that you would almost consider impossible or just so difficult um, because of access or uh, what have you, and um, being able to uh, go after those procedures robotically um, to make them safer. Is definitely one. Um, you know, uh, to, we get involved with uh, uh, how do you how do you make a procedure that's currently invasive much more minimally invasive, um, and that's going to happen more and more. Um, you know, and you, we're seeing surgical robotics across uh, everything, um, even in the dental field. I just saw you know Neosis uh, raised just thirty million in the dental space, right? So. Um, you know, in terms of answering your first question about, uh, you know, generally where they could go. Um, and then in terms of white space, um, you know, I think uh, this plays to more Luke's um, uh, uh, forte, and that is that we, we see also a future that's international, that's more adaptable internationally and more democratic and uh, technologies that are going to be able to to be more nimble in the marketplace because you know, we're, we're, we're about to see a shift. We're going to go from one major player in the market to a lot more competition and there's going to be a lot of dynamics in play. So it's, it's, uh, it's going to explode. You know, you, you mentioned Neosis and uh, I, I just think about how the, the whole dental space is a white space. And if you think about the amount of money being spent on, on implants and being able to solve that in a in a robotic fashion, I mean, it, there, there's a lot of money to be made in that area, and you're solving a real problem. Um, anyone else that has a perspective on that question from the audience? Yeah, I, I would I would just say that you know we 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 want to help enable. Uh, robotic. Hey, uh, Lisa, could you go on mute for a second? Sorry. Uh, I, I think we, you know, we just want to be an enabler to uh, better outcomes, and that's what we're about. And I think as you think of, in particular, within endovascular world, structural heart um, is booming, right? So how do we, it's, it's, it's tough to see where you're at. It's tough to understand rotational alignment, which is critical. So whether it's transeptal puncture, or mitral valve, or TAVR devices, um, it's all a big, big focus for us. And we hope that we can uh, help with the help of robotics companies um, have this one plus one equals three. Yeah. So I want to touch on an area that's kind of friend and foremost in our minds right now. So COVID, right? We've, I think everyone has been impacted by COVID in one way or the other. And I, I, I want to pose this question in a way that it doesn't deal with the obvious. I, I mean, we're, we're all affected by how COVID has affected the employees or shifted, you know, the work environment from company or office to home or delayed clinical trials. But how do you, it, how do you look at it from uh, how you've been forced to adapt 
the company and its road forward in a, in a way that uh, uh, allowed you to kind of still do the things you need to do and move forward. So it'd be great to kind of hear from you on, on how you approach that. Uh, Luke, do you, do you, how, how did that, uh, how did you guys manage to work around that? Yeah, um, well, <laughs> It has been, you know, it's certainly been a big change, and it's in, and it's a change we've had to we've had to leap on as a company. There's, there's a sense in which actually you're slightly looking at some of the consequences of that change, in the sense that uh, I'm in a meeting room, I'm looking at a decent camera, I've got a backdrop behind me, which sounds naive, but actually, if you've been, you know, with so much more of uh, customer contact going online, you know, we we we've invested heavily in the ability to provide people with an experience of what Versus is about without actually having to physically take a Versus to them and go and visit. It's the it's the impact really on, uh, I think it's actually, I think it's actually in many ways the impact on human relationships that is that is the thing that has been hardest to deal with. Uh, um, uh, uh, talking to, to surgeons or hospitals, building the relationships, getting building the partnerships that get a system which is a Substantial investment uh, uh, into in, into a hospital, working with them obviously on all the um, just the reality of doing surgical procedures in this in this in this very different environment. With regard to what robotics can build to a to a post COVID world, I there's part of me that thinks. Uh, you know, once things start to quieten down in six months or a year's time, will those things be so important? I don't know. Um, certainly, the potential for the surgeon to be slightly removed from the patient is is one thing. Uh, um, you can always put a console in the room next door. <sighs> My very limited experience of and, and, and our bigger experience as a company suggests that actually. COVID or no COVID, surgeons care about their patients and want to be in the same place as they are. So um, uh, I think there's some things there. I think that the teleproctoring, you, again, that you know, that's definitely going to be a thing in the future, and this is only going to accelerate that. Um, I think that's part of a larger general drive to uh, uh, you know, reduce the amount of people moving around, uh, reduce flights, all that kind of thing. Um, I come slightly to the perspective that it's it's actually less about robotics and it's more about the point that actually Eric was making about IT infrastructure really transforming things. Um, uh, I think it is going to be a while, if ever, before surgeons are comfortable with routinely operating, not being in the same place as their patient. Um, uh, I think the benefits are going to be around communication and about the people who don't Per se, need to be there, still being able to be present in some fashion. Yeah. So, so Mark, uh, you know, we had a conversation last week, and uh, and actually, it, th this question really came out of that that comment that you made to me about how you guys were in a position where you had to actually, you know, demo and engage with people around what you're developing, and uh, you had you had something interesting there. And I, I, do you want to share that? Uh, how you had to yeah. evolve. I, I, I would actually, and I think, um, you know, I, I think in these different uh, kind of therapy regimes in a, in a cat lab and, and things, I think we're going to find slightly different uh, experiences, uh, say, between what had been open surgery, laparoscopic surgery, and, and then robotic surgery with, a, with the surgeon in the same room. I mean, it makes perfect sense. But if you look at, uh, at our experience, um, you know, more a medical or we're developing a robot, uh, and we're we're at a stage where uh, we've got engineers that uh, need to work on it. We've got we've got to get clinician input on uh, on what it's like to actually drive this robot, uh, and uh, and and we've gotten some of that. We've done live animal work. We're 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 driving and refining what we're doing, and suddenly we're slammed with uh, with COVID, and the world is uh, is no longer bringing a bunch of people into individual shops and interacting with a tool altogether. And so what we ended up doing is, hey, we, we had already planned, uh, as, as Luke mentioned and the others have said, you know, remote proctoring, uh, you know, that makes a lot of sense. But we actually uh, ended up taking our basic architecture and saying, hey, we need to implement this now. Uh, and we brought capabilities uh, that, that really, frankly, leverage on 
uh, on existing uh, these web calls that just like uh, not this particular platform, but a, but a, a competitor to it, uh, where uh, we actually kind of hacked on our ability to, uh, to, to drive the robot. And, and we have now had clinicians interact with our robot. They've, they've driven our robot from uh, all around the US and from other continents. But what is, the interesting part is, yes, that's been great. It's actually allowed our engineers to be working on things together and, uh, without being in the same room, including driving and testing things. And that's been great. But what's actually been really interesting is, you know, we, we started figuring out there are more uh, beneficial ways of interacting if you're remote, if you want to proctor. There are things that you should be able to do uh, to, to help guide, say, somebody that's, that's local at the therapy that may not know, say, this particular patient anatomy or they're in an unusual situation. You want to give them guidance. Uh, it's actually really beneficial to be able to drive aspects of the robot. Uh, and, and, uh, and we've actually kind of altered our interaction based on uh, existing web-based uh, driving from clinicians and, yes, venture capitalists and, and uh, teammates that are spread out around the, the country and around the world. It, it, it would have to be uh, not anything we would have planned, but a real silver lining from, uh, from this uh, COVID nonsense. Yeah. Uh, Eric, did any perspective from you on, on how OR has had to adapt to, to kind of evolve around COVID? Yeah, absolutely. So I think there's there's two sides to it. Um, on the one hand, I, I agree, right? You have to adapt to, to your reality and the way in which you deploy, onboard, and support your technology and customers has fundamentally changed. And I think a lot of those practices will carry forward in just a more efficient way to do things. Others will not. Um, and so that, that that's true. But I would say also from a core technology standpoint, you know, cancer doesn't wait on COVID, and 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 so those procedures are ongoing. In other areas where it's more elective surgery, those are being delayed, but but not canceled. So, so if you have a well-designed technology, well thought through value proposition, you know those procedures will endure. And so I'd say be balanced and patient as well. Great. So, it is a question from the audience, um, and and this is a, this is a big one, right? When we think about you know, barriers of, of new technology, where obviously we think about adoption, we think about how people pay for it, but the other big elephant is regulatory. So the, the question from the audience is, what, what do the panelists think uh, are the biggest regulatory hurdles they see in the use of robotic surgery? Um, who wants to tackle that hot button right there? Everybody raise your hands all at once. <laughs> Luke, what do you think? Uh, okay, I laughed. All right, I asked for it. Um, it's a yeah. It's I mean, you know, it's a difficult time for for for, for regulatory and robotics. Um, uh, uh, in Europe, CE mark MDD is shifting to MDR. People are still working out what that means. Um, uh, in America, um, uh, the FDA is really tightening up about what should and shouldn't have a 510K and what it should and shouldn't do if you're going to 510K it. Um, that lack of clarity is 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 very difficult. Uh, um, uh, my, you know, I'm a technologist. I'm not a regulatory expert. My plea to the regulatory experts in the company is always, you know, tell us what we need to do and we'll get it into shape so that it's ready to go. Uh, uh, and um, dealing, you know, dealing with uncertainty there is is very difficult. Uh, uh, that's the straightforward answer. Um, you will will we work through it? Yes, of course we will eventually. Um, but in the meantime, it's 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 another it's another thing to worry about. Um, and given the rate at which the technology is changing, you therefore sort of slightly worry about will 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 regulatory ever catch up um uh, uh you know never 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 mind all automation um uh, uh even uh, sort of much more subtle subtler levels of mediation between direct human control and what the system actually does um raise 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 very interesting regulatory questions 
um, uh, uh, you know, the question of how you validate some of these very sophisticated products or even AI-based products is um, a very interesting one. Eric, how, how do you look at this from from Or's point of view? I, I agree with Luke, right? It, it's it's a FDA is is adapting their practices and, and trying to keep pace with the proliferation of the technology. And you know, their first um, you know mandate is to is to protect the patient. And I think they're taking the steps that they feel is necessary, and and they're adapting. And, and to Luke's point, I, I just believe and hope that if we as industry continue to engage with FDA in thoughtful discussion that it will continue to adapt in some areas that are more restrictive today maybe less so and, and perhaps return to 510k but it's complicated and, and and I'd say you know to repeat myself engagement is key and a thoughtful conversation around the risks amongst each other and with FDA is required and, and, and as I said I, I hope FDA continues to, to adapt and respond and you know that that's all we can hope for. Yeah. Yeah. And I, if I just butt in, I mean, to, to make a point that I didn't perhaps make as strongly as I should have done, I, I do agree with the transition and the direction of travel of the regulatory authorities. Um, we're getting to a better place, and I think there's a lot to be said for the need to be in a better place. But, uh, you know, that, that process is difficult and challenging for everybody. So we have just three minutes left. And I have so many more questions to ask, but I, I'm, I'm going to limit it to maybe one final question. And maybe if, if, if we could just go around the table around it, because I, I think to me, it's such a hot area. And Phil, you touched on it earlier, which is, I, I think this whole area of evolution with AR, VR integration into robotics, and, and we can really see that that impact occurring. I mean, uh, when I when I think through it, the ideas are just they're, they're mind-boggling about what, what could happen there. So how do we see this blend into robotics uh, going forward? So it's a must-have, not a nice-to-have. Um, Phil, I'm going to start with you, and then if each of you can just touch upon it lightly, we'll probably be able to finish on time. Yeah, I mean, I would say it's um, it's important, and I think it's going to become more standard uh, as we evolve. And And why I say that is really based on um, you know, physician staff burnout and turnover. You think about uh, the the triple aim we we had in healthcare, or still have, right, around patient experience and outcomes and decreasing costs, and now becoming the quadruple aim around really the care of the physician and the healthcare workers. And uh, with that is going to have to come technologies that allow you to reduce wearing lead, let's say, in fluoroscopic procedures. It could be on moving of the head. It could be on cataracts, those types of things. So I think there's good hope for these types of new technologies to really evolve what we do today. Mark, briefly. Yeah, the uh, VR, AR, I, I see augmented reality. It's already available on, uh, on robots that are out there. There's data that uh, the doctor wants to know, uh, and we can fuse different types of imaging. We can combine robotic data with, with image data. Uh, it's going to be incremental, but it's starting already, and it's going to just help so much on just awareness of what's going on in the surgical space. Great. Lisa. Hey, I was just going to say, um, I was uh, having a conversation with Dr. Kayu from the Cleveland Clinic for Robotics Lab in Akil just a couple weeks ago. And um, in that conversation, we were just uh, referencing one of the biggest needs is in training and the training load that's going to have to happen going forward. And I just see, you know, um, AR, VR as being a huge, carrying the heavy, heavy load in that area. Yeah. Eric, how do you see this? Yeah, I agree. You know, with our Monarch platform, from day one, we had a procedural simulator, and we still do. And I think the key is tying, um, I should say, uh, non-patient-specific simulation to real patient uh, cases that, that are coming up or, 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 or you know, mid-case preoperative. And so I think there's huge gains there, taking liberties a little bit with, I think, the AR, VR, and 10, the question. But I think making it accessible and patient specific and tying training and simulation to, to real world perioperative experience for the physician there, there's tons of, of benefit there great and luke 
Uh, I think its immediate impact will be in the training environment. I think it's got yeah. huge potential in the training world, it, uh, potential. Uh, but actually, I think that as people start to get used to it from a training environment, then its real value and applications in actual surgery, displaying real information, but also, you know, providing a more optimized environment for doing surgery by having things that aren't really there, apparently there, will become apparent. But but I, but I think it's through training that you're going to see its first very real impact. Well, great. Well, I'd like to thank everyone, thank our panelists for the participation today. I, I found the conversation was really stimulating and exciting about the future of robotics. Just to remind everyone, we have another panel on November 17th where we're going to be hosting experts uh, who'll be talking about robotics and medicine. So stay with us at, at that time. Join us live. Uh, so thank you again. And as a reminder, please go vote today if you haven't. Um, and uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Thank you. Thank you.